Good evening, everyone. Evening in Europe, anyway. Welcome to another 60 Times Battle Lounge with the 2MK team. I've just barely missed the start of this first match. And technically I should be on spectate for various reasons. I think I can change that now. Yes. As always, there's a ton to look at and work on in this game. A practice we would like to keep up, especially considering that we do really only play this game. I guess it's twice a week now if you play in both the EU and the NA lounges. Today we're thinking about move economy. And I guess that means that these two get the air rematch. Since I am going to be in spectate for a little bit and I am going to be quiet for a little while. Some games have a very high move economy in, the, in that you shouldn't move or do attacks, specifically mostly doing attacks, more than you need to or more than you think they're going to actually strike your opponent or force them to do something. Whereas there are other games where you basically want to be pressing something all the time because people move so fast and stray hits do so much damage that it's better for your survival if you're just making sure to be putting some hit box in front of you. Especially if it's one that's relatively harder to whiff punish because of the nature of the game. This game sits squarely in the middle. The specific moves you do are often so complex relative to those hitboxes that they're not easy to whiff punish. But it also requires you to think quite a lot about which position you're in before you actually take any actions. And a lot of the time, the question isn't which action, even for characters with lots of options, which is nearly everyone. The question is, closer to, should I take any? But because it's so squarely in the middle, you can't really say that either one of those two things is more or less correct than the other. Sometimes you are explicitly looking to do a move because it's time to do that, and sometimes you are specifically trying not to do a move because you're not in the right position. Where this applies a lot more, though, is in your hold game. And that's what we'll be discussing quite heavily today. But that discussion will be in maybe 10 minutes rather than right now. So feel free to hang around and get that information that way. This is our EU lounge, as noted, so you will possibly have Difficult connections to certain players. If you are in the Midwestern United States, for example, or just don't have terribly good internet and are joining from anywhere it would be sensible to join from, which in this case would technically be anywhere in range of the Atlantic Ocean. But again, your internet is going to matter and this game's netcode is specifically... It works out a particular way that it's difficult to judge whether or not it's going to be great. With the deciding factor seemingly more so whether or not you are on a Wi-Fi connection or a plugged in one. But even the Wi-Fi will work if it's really good, so just bear it in mind when you're joining. Particularly if you're not sure how well 
you are able to play the game and react to things. This, game, this lounge has a three consecutive win limit, mind you, so even if you do join and are easily able to fight most people in the lounge, you will still eventually be rotated to the back, mostly for variety and so that we can talk about different things. But for now, you can expect to hear from me again in about 10 minutes rather than commentary on the upcoming match.
All right, it seems that once again we are blessed with the perfect person to go along with the thing we're trying to describe. Almost one of those times where the three consecutive wins is working against us, but it depends. We'll probably manage to talk about what needs to be talked about really quickly. So far we've seen a Diego that hits a lot of pressure and buttons, and a Kasumi who I expect to be the same. And we get back into move economy there. This is particularly useful because of what our Ayane's intention in training was. Notice the relatively low move economy of this player. You can absolutely play both Kasumi and Diego that way. Just hit buttons whenever you can and hope your opponent will hit the wrong ones in response and approach. Because if you block, well rather if they block, they're not necessarily going to benefit. And the Wi-Fi, while it is a problem, is only a problem because it's harder to tell whether or not you should be pressing anything. But if you have an opponent who demonstrates to you that they're going to keep being that way, that they're always going to be pressing something more or less, it's a lot easier to figure out and you don't have to rely on the Wi-Fi aspect as much, or rather you don't have to worry about it as much. This type of player, and these characters in particular, win mostly by striking enough times that eventually you're going to mess up the defense or the spacing for dealing with the strike. And you should just not worry about that. In fact, you should worry more about what happens once you are hit, because then you have to calm yourself as much as possible, or, you know, depending on your character, just go ham as much as possible. But your aim is to decide based on spacing in the moment you wake up. Try to focus so that you're not actually doing anything or thinking about anything. And this is probably the better way to put it. Try not to be thinking until you just before the moment before you are able to take an action. Thinking before that means that you're basically rolling the dice and so is your opponent. And as they have better buttons when they're closer than you do, it's not usually a great idea to roll those dice. If you can clear your mind right up until the moment where you finished blocking their string, assuming it was even a string, you'll be able to recognize what your options are. And usually this doesn't slow you down enough that you will lose based on frame data or anything like that. You just strike because that's your instinct. And it's a good thing to build up in all sorts of games, but this one in particular, because your character has so many move options, and so many different ways of delivering their strikes that making a judgment before the final situation, before the moment where you need to hit the button itself, when you are on defense, is usually going to get you killed one way or the other. This applies to your holds and throws as well, in fact more so. If you've been hit, especially if you don't want to block, the best timing to decide which hold to use and whether or not to hold at all is often the moment of recovery. Don't spend any time during the opponent's string thinking about what their next strike is likely to be. Just wait until your character can hold, which in the case of actually being hit by a string is not quite the same, but you can usually think of it a little later. At least wait until their move is done animating. Because once you've learned to do this, the few times where that's not the best option are always times where your opponent is doing a string that you could learn to then recognize. It might take you a while, but that's the timing and the way you'd learn to recognize it. If you see it continuing, if there's no gap where you should then start thinking again, then it's up to the part of your mind that just does observation. But that's not usually the default part of your mind to be using here. I often describe this as people needing to relax, but it's not strictly speaking that relaxation is in any way involved. It's literally just, and you can describe it however you like to remember it yourself, it's just that you don't think as early. Don't turn on the decision-making part of your brain until you're a little further into the situation. If you're aiming for a really complex offense, you often need to do that, but that's a totally different feeling. 
it's also quite true that a lot of the time when you aren't sure about which decision to make, even in that moment, you probably should just keep blocking. And if you get more and more used to fighting games as a generality, you'll learn to not only keep blocking, but be ready with your throw tech, but not actually just throw tech, because it's the same thing. The faster you get, the easier it will be to successfully throw tech. But of course, if it were always easy, then throws would be fairly useless. So please, don't expect to get out of opposing throws too quickly or too often if your opponent is overloading your mental stack. Otherwise, it would just be terrible. It would be kind of boring. In fact, you should spend more time thinking about, did I recognize a throw? If you find yourself thinking, I tapped that throw, I tapped it because I pressed the button, that's a good sign. Because it just means you're slower than you need to be, not that you made any incorrect decision or that you overthought a situation. Because you can just get faster by training. Wrong decision making is something that plagues players of fighting games for, in some cases, close to their whole lives, as it isn't really fixed by just playing more across enough games for you to keep up a, let's call it, career. But we're of course only talking about your willingness to play these games and enjoy them.
するといいわ。ええ、有名人が俺の相手。I wasn't sure whether or not I was going to be able to make anything of that specific match. It turns out that I could have, but it also probably wasn't a great idea to try. I'm about to find out what this player's connection is like. Having low ping bars does not necessarily mean anything, and being on Wi-Fi can make it worse, but as they are not, this could be bearable. I'll probably get the report on what the match is like in a bit, and it didn't look too laggy just now, but it was hard to tell because both players were doing almost the exact opposite of what they needed to do versus each other. We had one player whose idea of fighting with their character was to do more things, and another who went for holds a lot. And these two things normally result in the player who goes for the holes being demolished simply because of the way the timing works for staggering your holds. You'll often hold and start your hold at a timing where you're in recovery or something when the opponent actually strikes you. In fact, you might see it demonstrated here quite well. A person who's relatively good at holds can learn to do this, but it only really works on people who are very pressury or if you're patient enough to learn the spacings in between there, as just demonstrated. <laughs> Learning to react more easily by letting go is something you see demonstrated. And once you've noticed that your opponent has the weakness I've described, it's actually a lot easier to fight them because all you have to do is figure out which way to stagger your attacks. And in general, not finish any of your strings, or finish them with really difficult or complicated things. Particularly if you have a good throw character, you really tend to have a good luck against the style of player, because all you really have to do is hit them once or twice, usually just once, and then go for the throw almost immediately, because their intention is to hold you, so the hold will almost always work, because that's the nature of it. Similarly, a player who is not dealing with it in that way will often end up throw attacking you as demonstrated. So a lot of the time, this is move economy being poorly done in a different situation, in a different direction. You don't need to do anything. In fact, you've noticed that literally every time our Lei Fang has just, just continued a combo at all with punches, she's been held every time. So there's no real reason to do this. 
but she went for punch again and therefore got thrown. Well, got help. It's not to say that you should just throw literally every time. It's simply the understanding that the timing of what you're doing has to be focused around the fact that even the slightest predictable action will lead to your opponent managing to hold you as shown because they've focused that part of their playstyle. Similarly, understanding how to be more confusing than just the light punch or the standing punch to get more throws or to make use of your range by using more kicks of specific and different heights, whereas punches tend to be a little bit harder, particularly on characters like Lei Fang, will increase your perception of how your opponent moves and increase your chances of winning. This is a relatively difficult thing for our Lei Fang to do though, as it's easy to double tap buttons, and when you do double tap things, it tends to finish your combo for you, even if you didn't mean to double tap them that much. So, today looks like, assuming that she ends up fighting this opponent multiple times, is going to be a hard and fast class in not double tapping things and starting with the intention of just hitting once. The report is that there is no lag. As always, we'll always say don't pay attention to those bars. Games and networks have generally gotten good enough now that if the bars don't move, they don't fluctuate, chances are your connection is going to be good, even if not perfect. Good enough to play and learn some things if you're not already at the upper levels of a game. We'll see if this player's style continues. But it doesn't matter as much whether or not it does because Tina in particular gets to break these rules slightly. Her throw range and throw options are so good that she could use them in the places where a lot of other people would use holds. The important thing to consider in this matchup style though is that you as the player defending nearly never need to hold ever. You can almost always just block and focus your gameplay on the range and distance between you and your opponent when you're done blocking. Which is an interesting fight because they of course are doing the same. They do show some opportunities for holds eventually, but those are almost always based on blocking first. Once you've blocked enough, you'll be at positions where the optimal action is to hold. But at that point, you might as well just break hold because it will get you out of the situation entirely and the rest of the matchup doesn't rely on it. And since your break hold works against all strikes, it's super useful that way. The main reason why this is your default is because once you are far enough away from an opponent based on blocking, most other characters can't throw you and therefore they have to strike and lose to your break hold. Now, whether or not this gives you an advantage or not isn't really so easy to say, but in terms of making a decision about what to do in a situation, you can start from that perspective. The opponent is either looking for pressure, which won't necessarily be effective, or looking to hold you if you get your own pressure started.
as noted by our joiner, we do have match two open. For example, if you just want to get a turn faster or don't want to be on stream, but still want a chance at fighting. Getting other people to join it can be a little bit harder, but that's a patience question, as you're either you're going to be waiting one way or the other. This sort of thing also helps you increase your understanding and spacings for ranges. In particular, there are two moves which are basically universal, where your ranges are super important and they differ a lot by character in ways that can't necessarily be understood. With consistency, that is. Your actual special button basically the one you use for the break hold and for your super attack just demonstrated by Ariane is very character dependent actually and for this you literally just tap whatever button that is whatever it is you use for your break hold whatever it is you use for the other you just tap This attack then goes into a string that can only be stopped by your opponent's break hold. Which makes it really useful when you're pretty much sure you're going to get an attack off. As it's often a very quick attack as well. Shifting the situation. For example, normally you want to use your punches if you're not sure if your opponent could block in the situation because you generally can vary out of your string there and your opponent doesn't end up advantaged if you stop you can at least control that the attack space though created by tapping the other button is a little different Did they actually wait long enough this time for someone else? Uh, looks like no. I wonder if these two have good connection to each other. Here we're going to see what is probably the ultimate test of move economy as is described in the stream relative to the characters we've seen so far. There are definitely other characters, other matchups where it's all you have to think about, but this gets pretty high up there. Rachel is similar to Diego. She is functionally a pressure character. She can keep on punching you because she's built to do that and you don't generally get to do much about it. But, if you block her, her distances aren't always so great, and though she does definitely have tools where she can take certain risks to get there, it's not always a good idea to do that. But the answer isn't usually to hold her, it's often to either sidestep or go for a low. And if your lows aren't fast enough, it gives her quite a bit of advantage in a matchup. But remember that we started from a playstyle where this player is very good at holds and thinks quite a lot about how to get the holes correct. So, putting yourself in positions where you're attacking a blocking opponent quickly 
normally leads to problems so far against this player, and generally won't give you a lot of forward momentum to use for anything. You either have to be really confusing in your movement enough to make them hold incorrectly, get close enough to get your throws, or have a lot of control over your offense buttons in a way that will lead to you getting advantage just by frame data wise. For example, I'm surprised that didn't get held. But this is again a matter of mental stress on an opponent. If you can figure out how to get the opponent to the point where they have to think about whether or not you're coming to throw them or not, that's where your advantage will appear. In short, if you keep on punching, they will absolutely hold you. If you keep on punching then kicking, I can't be sure, but they might manage it. You must do all three of those things, punches, punches into kicks, and possibly punches into throws or just straight throws, before you get any advantage. And since it's very hard to hold Rachel, even I would almost say harder to hold Rachel than to hold Kasumi, you have to spend a lot more time focused on distance and whether or not you should be blocking at a specific range because of the interaction you just had. That's one of the things that makes learning this game the most complex. Matchups are not just about range and certainly not just about button options. They're heavily built in whether or not you need to do a specific option more at a range or not. And remembering that for every character is something that often only comes up if you've got really good fighting game awareness as a whole, simply because you end up thinking more about it. Characters fight a lot closer in this game, and if you've built up the concept of close battle means X from other games, which is quite likely because of the way the games work in general, you're going to have to train that out of yourself quite a bit to play DOA effectively. I often wonder if that's one of the contributing factors to why it's not terribly popular. It's harder to zone in the game. There isn't really a zoning option. Certain characters have long enough normals that they can do something like it, but they can't usually pin you down at the other end of the screen or prevent you from approaching altogether. You just sidestep as often people do in Tekken with your only real issue being that it's hard to stop once you've started moving. This has come up a lot lately in our gameplay across various games that the amount of time it takes your opponent to move from dashing to blocking heavily incentivizes you to hit buttons or not hit buttons when they you just see them start approaching. Sometimes all they want is to get into position and they're kind of hoping that you hit a button. King of Fighters and for example now that it's been changed Melty Blood and sometimes they are actually committing to that dash up attack which is what you'll often see in DNF to a point since mostly the only thing your opponent can do is uppercut and under night because they have so many options out of the dash that are quick and they keep a lot of the momentum or have special moves. This does apply somewhat in this game as well because certain characters do have dashing moves but at least those moves are predictable they don't just hit every option. If they are dashing and hit kick they'll do a different move and don't just get to choose from their entire arsenal of kicks. But what happens when you've got a character from a game that explicitly has those options but is now placed in DOA? And that's one of the main things that Kula is complicated in. She has a lot of normals that suit this game, but the playstyle of this game, as well as the loss of one specific move that tends to flow quite a lot, means that it's harder for her to operate in the way you might expect her to.
you can learn quite a bit about fighting her from fighting her in KOF and fortunately tomorrow is actually the release of our Snow Angel bot which effectively gives you a bot for Kula in King of Fighters 15 but this is not that Kula this is a matter of playing a lot of neutral there are there's you could say hops but they're not the same but the constant feeling of needing to dash up and then block isn't really the core game plan here for either side. And in fact, because of the difficulty of defending in this game due to having to defend more or less three ways, even at relatively closer ranges, we're going to count the forward hold for kicks and the back hold for punches as separate defenses here because for many of us, they're mentally different. You'll often find yourself being pushed into these positions. One thing she is good at though, balanced mainly by her shorter normals and relative predictability, is she can put you under pressure similarly to how she does it in that game. And she's relatively harder to sidestep for some reason, mostly because her normals are so quick and she does so many longer strings that getting out of her range in order to sidestep safely can be kind of hard. benefit one often faces that Bayman will probably help show off the most is that in this game lows are similar conceptually to how overheads are in other games. Your default block position should be straight back which is in itself hard to get used to at least for some but more importantly the low attacks can be quite dangerous and they don't all have relatively longer startup. Many do, and that is one of the main things that helps you survive. You actually get a lot of time. But because the startup of moves in this game is so relatively complicated in terms of animation, and because many characters don't actually crouch that much to do their low attacks, it's not too easy to do. Striking with lows, therefore, particularly lows that you don't expect to hit unless your opponent is attacking, is a risky proposition in one or two ways, but not terribly bad. The main reason this tends to work out is that that type of low isn't allowed to do a lot of damage and often doesn't start combos. Characters who are allowed to have lows at that range, mainly Bayman, Kasumi, and Diego, are often relying on other things once they're close anyway, and therefore it's probably fine, but you do have to watch out for it quite a lot when you're facing them. There's the hop. I feel that matchup isn't terribly good, you have to be able to hold far too well, quote-unquote, on Bayman for that to work out.
And the KOF continues. If you want a my bot, we released that previous week. But again, this refers to King of Fighters 15 and doesn't necessarily help you here. Fortunately, Mai is relatively similar to what she is like in KOF. You just have a lot more options to deal with her on defense. Interestingly, because of the way her ranges work in this game and the knockbacks and similar, she's not terribly good at pressure. She's not really good at pressure in King of Fighters either though, so you can't really say that's a big deal. You do have to worry more about her lows, and she does have really good combos to make up for this. As well as the standard aerial stuff and hops. You end up blocking for a long time, but the core of the gameplay versus this character is block until you see an opening to throw, and then throw immediately. There's no question about what you should be doing. You generally sh shouldn't punch her. You generally shouldn't look for long range into kick. Just throw basically right away. And this is intentional, so it's not as if she has a counter for it. She doesn't actually have one per se. Obviously, it's not going to work every time, but the idea is that your opponent must work to make it so that the throw will fail, more so than the fact that, oh yeah, they'll just counter it. They're looking for a way to mess you up when you've gone for it by, for example, using different or better options, more complex stuff in their attack strings, so that you don't know whether or not she's at the end or not, which is a very different prospect to can she counter the throw if I do figure it out. That might be a little bit hard to get used to. But you can't always work around it all that much. We see here our Tina exploring other defensive options, which are also helpful, but they're close to the same thing. You have to have a fairly good idea of what Maya is going to do in her string for it to be a good idea to go for them. So you're mentally facing the same challenge. And of course, on top of all of that, once you've learned this, you can get used to the idea that in order for your opponent to stop you, they must do specific things in their strings, which you might then be able to hold yourself. But your default should not be to try to hold things, because she often doesn't keep herself close enough to you to make that required. I so expected that move to hit multiple times. Since we're closing out the stream in the next match, you will probably see some people switching to match 2 to continue fighting against the player just described. Which means we now have a relatively clear split between fighting against the player who has control of spacing and therefore forces you to decide between hold and not hold, and a player who has control of timing, who then makes you think about whether or not you should even try. Assuming that these two players continue to win, even with our three consecutive wins rule on, or with a split of just three people in general, looks like lots of practice will happen in multiple directions. So if you are joining in, please note this yourself. This is our last on-stream match of the night slash evening slash midday, depending on where you actually are in the world. But, assuming these players stick around for a bit, and considering who needs the practice, making it very similar, if you are hopping in, join queue number one 
if your goal is to face players who are good enough at pressure to make you think about how to defend. For example, if you want to work on that type of defense. And similarly, if you want to work on offense and understanding of how to get different options into your opponent's head, join queue number two. Or just pick randomly depending on how you feel and shift if you realize, oh wait, no, I needed to work on the other thing. While we continue to regret not being able to give bots for this game that you can actually use during matches or similar, honestly, if you're showing up mostly to these lounges and playing as often as we are, you might as well use the ones we've got over at 2-mk.org. They don't save, they're hard to input, they're inconsistent, and if you go into rank, they immediately disappear. Literally everything negative about bots that we complain about in every other game, all of them are present here at the same time. So we don't generally recommend them. I think, however, that we will still continue to work on them. And the main thing that will stop us is lots of other games coming out that are going to require some use of them going forward. Basically that we have other bots to develop and we only actually put out one a week. So you'd have to manage with the ones we've got. However, most people getting into this game who would need bots outright are the sort who can get the free version, the core fighters version, and those are the bots we have created. One for each of those four characters. So, at least on that front, you should be covered. Unfortunately, since the game also does not save more than one bot at a time, if we can even call it saving, good luck. That brings us to the end of our stream for tonight. However, you can probably join us later for the NA version of this lounge at 7 p.m., 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You'll see a tweet on our Twitter to underscore MK underscore FGC to confirm that that's happening. And if you don't see it by about 7.45 Eastern, assume that it's not for whatever reason. We'll probably be discussing less stuff then, but it does depend on who shows up to the lounge at that point. So. We'll hope to see at least some of you then. This has been Rillian, 14 to MK. Good luck with your training and good night, everyone. <laughs>